Theistic evolution critique. We're going to be going through the introduction. Um, before we do that, I want to point out that it's probably worth our while talking about theistic evolution because it can be confusing. And I'm going to give you my t uh, view, and then in the introduction, um, in particular, Steve Meyer will give you uh, his view on it, and you can see how well they mesh or don't mesh. But <clears throat> if I were dividing the way people look at things uh, into major groups, I would do it in this way. Uh, first, there is what I would call young life creation. And there are distinctions in between that, such as is it young life, is it young earth, is it young universe? And right now I'm not interested in those fine details. But what I am interested in is uh, this is something that takes the first two chapters of Genesis pretty much completely literally. And uh, we're going to get into what literal is in, in a little while, but uh, uh, then there's what you would call old earth creationism, which kind of the Hugh Ross type of uh, way of viewing things, that has God creating brand new species, uh, but doing so um, over long periods of time, and that allows certain parts of the uh, Genesis record to be uh, read fairly straightforwardly, uh, and other parts need a little uh, extra interpretation. Um, then there's what I would call ID theistic evolution, and uh, that is where there isn't any special creation, but God monkeyed with genes or did something to allow new species to develop. And not just new species, but new genera, new families, new uh, classes, and so forth. And of course, with God in there, anything can happen. And so you don't have a problem with, uh, uh, with evolution not being adequate. Um, and then there's what I would call non-ID theistic evolution. <coughs> now, these are labels I'm putting on, but the label is not nearly import as important as the concept. And uh, that one believes that God did it, but he did it through a method that is indistinguishable from uh, the last category, which is atheistic evolution. It believes God did not have a hand in it at all. And in fact, depending on whether you're going to be a deist or, a, uh, or an atheist, um, God may not have even started the universe. And the interesting thing of it is that the dividing line in what you might call culture war actually comes between these two, even though they're labeled the same, and even though uh, theistic evolution used to be comfortable with either side. Because what really happens is, if you can detect that God intervened, you're suddenly in a whole different ball game, and science is not made safe for atheism. But that is how I would divide things. Now, having said that, this is going to be a critique of number four. Um, and that may make things a little bit easier for you to see. They're going to be this is really making a lot of noise. Try it here and see if it will quiet down a little bit. Um, but um, uh, it will not be a critique specifically of atheistic evolution, although that will be hit kind of on the side. And the fascinating thing of it is when they get to the Bible, it kind of settles into young earth even though it doesn't, uh, it explicitly uh, disavows that goal. 
Uh, and that's one of the things that struck me about the book. But anyway, um, it is written by people who can be classified as young life, old earth, and ID theistic evolution. Uh, yes? Um, is there a distinction between four and uh, methodological naturalism? Uh, four commonly accepts methodological naturalism as a, um, as a legitimate a way of doing science and uh, in fact we're going to come to that so pay attention when we get there um, in fact what often happens is that four wants to muddy the waters at that point but now <clears throat> first we're going to talk about the foreword which makes some really excellent points and it's written by Steve Fuller and more about Steve Fuller other than that he's a uh, chaired professor at uh, uh, War University of Warwick in, uh, in the United Kingdom. He starts, it is an honor and a pleasure to write the foreword to this book, which sets a new standard for Christian engagement with contemporary science. The cumulative effect of the set of papers assembled in this volume is to suggest that the God hypothesis, or what philosophers call divine action, remains very much on the table as a scientific explanation for events in the history of life. Christians who fail to deal seriously with that point, perhaps out of deference to secular scientific authority, end up selling short both science and their faith. I take this to be the most important challenge that the scientists and scholars in these pages are offering to theistic evolutionists. Doesn't sound like he's too happy with that way of dealing thing, with things. By conventional Christian standards, I do not think that I would count as a person of faith, though I may count as one by conventional secular standards. In any case, I write as someone who was confirmed in the Roman Catholic Church and studied on scholarship with the Jesuits before attending university. The Jesuits are notori notoriously rationalistic in their approach to matters of faith, which has always appealed to me. I was never compelled to declare belief in God, but was strongly encouraged to question default secular solutions to problems of knowledge and action. As a result, I've been, been a seeker, a term originally used to characterize Christian dissenters from the Church of England in the 17th century, which Thomas Henry Huxley appropriated two centuries later when he described himself as an agnostic on matters of faith. That's an interesting set of ideas. The real question for me has been not whether God exists, but how the deity operates in the world, including all the issues that raises for what we should believe and how we should act. In this respect, I have always regarded atheism in the true sense, that is, anti-theism, not simply anti-clericalism, as a moral and or epistemic failure, perhaps a prudishness, if not absence of the imagination, which when threatened can morph into bigotry toward that which one simply fails to understand. The neologism theophobia would not be out of place here. My Jesuit teachers would go one step further and ask atheists the following question. What advantage would your understanding of reality gain by dismissing out of hand the existence of a divine intelligence such that it would be worth the loss of meaning to your life and reality more generally? But this is a book about theists who contest the place of modern science in Christianity. The charge laid at the doorstep of theistic evolutionists is that the doorstep is exactly where they leave their religious commitments when they enter the house of science. They do this even though the weight of evidence from across the natural sciences does not uh, oblig oblige such a conclusion. On the contrary, from cosmology to biology, it is becoming increasingly clear that science's failure to explain matters at the most fundamental level is at least in part due to an institutional prohibition on intelligent design as one of the explanatory options. In these pages, methodological naturalism is the name by which this prohibition goes, but it could equally be called methodological atheism, and I would have to agree with that. Like some leaders of the intelligent design movement, I was formally trained in a field called history and philosophy of science. As the name indicates, the field combines history, philosophy, and science in search of a lost sense of purpose in organized inquiry that began with the proliferation of the academic disciplines in the 19th century. The field's guiding idea is that if we understand how something as distinctive as science came about and was sustained over the centuries, we might have a better sense of what it says about us and hence where it and we should be going. I'm going to skip a little bit there. 
History and philosophy of science truly came of age in the 1960s, a period of widespread disaffection with science's complicity in what was then called the military industrial complex. This disaffectation was expressed in light of a general understanding that the West had experienced a scientific revolution in the 17th century, which radically transformed how people thought about themselves and their relationship to the cosmos. What most struck the historians and philosophers of science who investigate this takeoff point for the human condition was that it was a part of a more general spiritual awakening of Christian Europe in what is normally called the Protestant Reformation. And precisely because the original turn to science involved a break from the established authority of the Roman Catholic Church, science's submission to establish secular authority during the Cold War appeared to, to betray that founding spirit. Readers of this volume should consider the challenge to theistic evolution found in this volume in a similar light. While it is generally accepted that the Protestant Reformation overlapped with the scientific revolution, this is often treated as a mere historical accident when in fact something far closer to a causal connection obtains between the two events. The first movement in the human history to trust the ordinary person's ability to judge the weight of evidence for themselves was the drive to get people to read the Bible for themselves. Until the 16th century, Christianity found itself in a peculiar position of being a faith founded on a sacred book through which God communicated with humans, yet relatively few of the faithful could read, let alone affirm, its contents. The Protestant Reformation reversed that. <clears throat> the scientific revolution then extended that judge for yourself attitude to all of physical reality by explicitly treating nature as a second sacred book. Thus, it is not surprising that Francis Bacon, with whom the scientific method is normally associated, was also instrumental in the production of the King James Version of the Bible. Today, science enjoys an unprecedented authority because of both of the number of people who believe in it and the number of subjects to which their belief applies. In this respect, our world resembles the one faced by the Protestant reformers in that people today are often discouraged because of the authority of science from testing their faith in its claims by considering the evidence for themselves. Instead, they are meant to defer to the authority of academic experts who function as a secular clergy. But unlike the 16th century, when the Protestant reformers themselves drove the mass literacy campaigns to get people to read the Bible, we live in a time of unprecedented access to knowledge about science, both formally and informally, from the classroom to the internet. Moreover, pro public opinion surveys consistently show that people are pro-science as a mode of inquiry, but anti-science as a mode of authority, which, in my opinion, they should be. And so, while it has become part of secular folklore, to say that the Catholic Church repressed the advancement of science if repression implies the thwarting of an already evident desire and capacity to seek knowledge, then today's scientific establishment seriously outperforms the early modern church, and perhaps with the consent of theistic evolutionists. Cut. I commend this book as providing an unprecedented opportunity for educated non-scientists to revisit the spirit of the Reformation by judging for themselves what they make of the evidence that seems to have led theistic, evolutions, theistic evolutionists to privilege contemporary scientific authority above their own avowed faith. John Calvin famously likened the reading of the Bible to the wearing of spectacles to correct defective eyesight. Historically speaking, the original scientific revolution was largely the result of those who took his advice. Now it's gone in a different direction. But what was it about the Bible that led to such a wide variety of inquirers all wrestling with their Christian faith to come up with the form of science that we continue to practice today? This is an important question to ask because there is no good historical reason to think that science as we know it would have arisen in any other culture, including China, generally acknowledged to have been the world's main economic power prior to the 19th century, had it not arisen in Christian Europe. A distillation of research in the history of philosophy of science and philosophy of science suggests that two biblical ideas as having been crucial to the rise of science, both of which can be attributed to the reading of Genesis provided by Augustine, an early church father, whose work became increasingly studied in the late Middle Ages and especially the Reformation. Augustine captured the two ideas in two Latin coinages which prima facie cut against each other, Imago Dei and peccatum originis. 
The former says that humans are unique as a species and are having been created in the image and likeness of God, while the latter says that all humans are born having the inherited the tendency of Adam's error, original sin. Once Christians began to read the Bible for themselves, they too picked up picked out those ideas as salient in how they defined their relationship to God, which extended to how they did science. And this sensibility carried into the modern secular age as perhaps best illustrated in our own day by Karl Popper's slogan for the scientific attitude as a method of conjectures and refutations. The stronger the better in both cases. We should aspire to understand all of nature by proposing bold hypotheses something of which we are capable because of the imago dei, but to expect and admit de error, something to which we are inclined because of the peccatum ori originis, whenever we fall short in light of the evidence. <clears throat> the experimental method developed by Francis Bacon was designed to encourage just that frame of mind. And William Whewell, was only one of numerous theologians and philosophers who have suggested uh, ways of testing and interpreting the findings of science to reflect that orientation. Unfortunately, we live in a time in which only those who have themselves conducted science in some authorized manner are allowed to say anything about what science is and where it should go. Theistic evolution should be understood as a deformation that results under these conditions. Its advice to the faithful is to keep calm, trust the scientific establishment, and adapt accordingly, even if that it means ceding the Bible's cognitive ground. Yet, insofar as science has succeeded, as it has b because of the revival of the Imago Dei and Peccatum Originis, account of humanity, one might reasonably ask whether theistic evolution amounts to an outright betrayal of both the scientific and the Christian message. Christianity's direction of travel since the uh, Reformation has been that each person is entitled and maybe even obliged to decide on matters that impinge on the nature of their own being and to register that publicly. This volume provides an incredibly rich resource for Christians to do exactly that with regard to scientific matters. I hope it will empower them to question and propose constructive alternatives to the blanket endorsement of evolution by theistic evolutionists. Um, that's pretty powerful stuff. Um, and now we'll get into the scientific and philosophical introduction. Um, and um, a, the first thing is going to be called Defining Theistic Evolution. This is written by Stephen Meyer, who you may remember wrote the book Signature in the Cell and Darwin's uh, Doubt. In this book, we will provide a comprehensive scientific, philosophical, and theological critique of the idea known as theistic evolution. But before we can do that, we will need to define what the proponents of this perspective mean by theistic evolution, or evolutionary creationism, as it is sometimes now called. Remember, the concept is way more important than the label you put on it. Indeed, before we can critique this perspective, we will need to know ex what exactly it asserts. Is it a logically coherent position? Is it a theologically orthodox position? Is it supported by or consistent with relative sci relevant scientific evidence? The answer to each of these questions depends crucially on the definition or sense of evolution in play. Theistic evolution can mean different things to different people, largely because the term evolution itself has several distinct meanings. This introductory essay will describe different concepts of theistic evolution, each of which corresponds to a different definition of the term evolution. It will also provide an initial critical evaluation. Both here and in the essays that follow, we will focus most, but not all, of our critical concern on one particular formulation of the concept of theistic evolution, in particular, the one that affirms the most scientifically controversial and also most religiously charged meaning of evolution. It will be shown that three distinct meanings of the term evolution are especially relevant for, con for understanding three different possible concepts of theistic evolution. Wherever you see green ellipses, that means I'm omitting something. Evolution can refer to change over time, universal common ancestry, and the natural mechanisms that produce change in organisms. 
Evolution number one, change over time. The, the, he gives a bunch of examples and says these examples, however, have little or nothing to do with the modern day Neo-Darwinian Neo Darwinian theory of evolution. Skipping on a little bit, evolution defined as change over time can also re refer to observed minor changes in fe features of individual species. Most biologists think this, this kind of evolution, sometimes called microevolution, results from a change in the proportion of different variants of a gene called alleles within a population over time. And then he discusses peppered moths and finch beaks. Evolution number two, common descent, or universal common descent. Many biologists today also commonly use the term evolution to refer to the idea that all organisms are related by common ancestry. This idea is also known as a theory of universal common descent. This theory affirms that all known living organisms are descended from a single common ancestor somewhere in the distant past. Biology textbooks today often depict this idea just as Darwin did, with a great branching tree. The bottom of the trunk of Darwin's tree of life represents the first primordial organism, and it can also be called monophyletic. Evolution in this second sense not only specifies that all life shares a common ancestry, it also implies that virtually no limit exists to the amount of morphological change that can occur in organisms. It assumes that relatively simple organisms can, with adequate time, change into much more complex organisms. Thus, evolution in the second sense entails not only change, but also gradual, continuous, and even unbounded biological change. Evolution number three, the one that they will specially target, the creative power of natural selection uh, and random variation or mutation mechanisms. The term evolution is also commonly used to refer to the cause or mechanism that produces the biological change depicted by Darwin's tree of life. When evolution is used in this way, it usually refers to the mechanism of natural selection acting on random variations or mutations. Modern neo-Darwinists propose that natural selection acts on a special kind of variation called genetic mutations, which most of you are familiar with. We'll, I won't go into detail. Modern neo-Darwinists would also affirm the role of other apparently undirected evolutionary mechanisms such as genetic drift, um, but natural selection is the major form of creating the appearance of design. This third use of evolution entails the idea that the natural selection mutation mechanism has the creative power to produce fundamental innovations in the history of life. This definition of evolution is closely associated with or encompasses another definition of, of evolution, which Meyer will now offer. Evolution 3A, the natural selection random uh, variation or mutation mechanism can explain the appearance of design in living systems apart from the activity of an actual designing intelligence. That is, design can be only apparent. Evolutionary biologists since Darwin have affirmed that the natural selection me random variation mechanism not only explains the origin of all new biological forms and features, they, also, they have also affirmed a closely related idea, namely that this mechanism can explain one particularly striking feature of biological systems, the appearance of design. Biolo biologists have long recognized that many organized structures in living organisms give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. And that quote, of course, is from The Blind Watchmaker by Richard Dawkins. Yet Darwin and modern neo-Darwinists have argued that the appearance of design in living organisms could be more simply explained as the product of a purely undirected mechanism, in particular the variation natural selection mechanism. And he talks about human breeders that can produce woollier sheep by selecting them and then that nature itself could play the role of the breeder uh, with very cold winters killing off all of the other sheep and leaving only very woolly sheep at the end. This was Darwin's great insight. Nature in the form of environmental changes or other factors could have the same effect on a population of organisms as the intentional decisions of an intelligent agent. As Darwin himself insisted, there seemed to be no more design in the variability of organic beings and in the action of natural selection than in the course in which the wind blows. Or as the eminent evolutionary biologist Francisco Ayala has argued, Darwin accounted for design without a designer.
<coughs> this is a very important problem for them. Indeed, since 1859, most evolutionary biologists have understood the appearance of design in living things as an illusion, a powerfully suggestive one, but an illusion nonetheless. George Gaylord Simpson is quoted as saying, man is the result of a purposeless and natural process that did not have him in mind, even though he recognized design as well. But if apparent design is an illusion, if it is just an appearance, as both Darwinists and modern neo-Darwinists have argued, then it follows that whatever mechanism produced that appearance must be wholly unguided and undirected, otherwise it would be real. The third meaning of evolution raises a significant issue for any proponent of theistic evolution who affirms this meaning of evolution. Assessing different concepts of theistic evolution or evolutionary creation. The three different meanings of evolution described above correspond to three possible and distinct concepts of theistic evolution, one of which is trivial, one of which is contestable but not incoherent, and one of which appears deeply problematic. In the last case, special attention is due to the important issue of whether theistic evolutionists regard evolutionary the evolutionary process as guided or unguided. Evolution in the first sense, change over time, uh, no theist would contest the theological orthodoxy or logical coherence of such a statement. In fact, most of us in this room believe that. Understanding theistic evolution this way seems unobjectionable, perhaps even trivial. Another conception of theistic evolution affirms the second meaning of evolution. It affirms the view that God has caused continuous and gradual biological changes such that the history of life is best represented by a great branching tree pattern, as Darwin argued. Theistic evolution thus conceived is again not obviously logically incoherent, since God is conceived by theists, including biblical theists, is certainly capable of producing continuous and gradual change. Nevertheless, some biblical theists, I would cap myself as one of them, question universal common descent based on their interpretation of the biblical teaching in Genesis about God creating distinct kinds of plants and animals, all of which reproduce after their own kind. Some biblical theists likewise question that humans and lower animals share a common ancestry, and uh, I agree with that also. Um, and we'll be hearing more about that next week. Um, <clears throat> Uh, believing instead that the biblical account affirms that humans arose from a special creative act. Um, in addition to these theological objections, there is a growing body of scientific evidence and peer-reviewed literature challenging such a monophyletic picture of the history of life. These scientific challenges to the theory of universal common descent are reviewed, so they're going to discuss that part, in chapter 10 through 12 of this volume. Chapters 13 through 16 of this volume also discuss scientific evidence that challenges the idea that humans and chimps in particular share a common ancestor. Um, our next week's uh, presentation will be a, uh, interesting in relation to those ch chapters. A, an even more foundational issue arises when considering the cause of biological changes and the question of whether theistic evolutionists conceive of evolutionary mechanisms as a directed or undirected processes. Some proponents of theistic evolution openly affirm that the evolutionary process is an unguided, undirected process. Um, he cites Kenneth Miller, although the truth of the matter is Kenneth Miller waffles in one place. But <coughs> Nevertheless, most theistic evolutions, including geneticist Francis Collins, perhaps the world's best known proponent of the position, have been reluctant to clarify what they think about this important issue. The reason why is because they don't want either horn of the dilemma. Uh, in any case, where theistic evolution is understood to affirm the creative power of the neo-Darwinian and or other evolutionary mechanisms and to deny actual as opposed to apparent design in living organisms, that is, the third meaning of evolution discussed above, the concept becomes deeply problematic. Indeed, depending on how this particular understanding of theistic evolution is articulated, it generates either logical contradictions a theologically heterodox view of divine action or a convoluted and scientifically vacuous explanation. We'll go over that a little bit. Logically contradictory view. In the first place, some formulations of theistic evolution 
that affirm the third meaning of evolution result in logical contradictions. For example, if the theistic evolutionist means to affirm the standard neo-Darwinian view of the natural selection mutation mechanism as an undirected process while simultaneously affirming that God is still causally responsible for the origin of new forms of life, then the theistic evolutionist implies that God somehow guided or directed an unguided and undirected process. On the other hand, a proponent of theistic evolution may conceive of the natural selection mutation mechanism as a directed process, with God perhaps directing specific mutations. This view represents a decidedly non-Darwinian conception of the evolutionary mechanism. It also constitutes a version of the theory of intelligent design. Because if God did it, then it's intelligently designed even if only with the fingertips. Yet, if living organisms are the result of a directed process, then it follows that the appearance of design in living organisms is real, not merely apparent or illusory. How he did it is not, is not as germane as the question of whether he did it. Thus, any proponent of a theistic evolution who affirms that God is directing the evolutionary mechanism and who also rejects intelligent design implicitly contradicts himself. Of course, there is no contradiction in affirming both the God-guided mechanism of evolution and intelligent design, though few theistic evolutions have publicly taken this view, and uh, apparently rats is a notable exception. Um, Theologically problematic views. Other formulations of theistic evolution explicitly deny that God is directing or guiding the mutation selection mechanism and instead see a much more limited divine role in the process of life's creation. This is why you don't want to be too specific because you see you can get in trouble this way, theologically. One formulation affirms that God designed the laws of nature at the beginning of the universe to make the origin and development of life possible or even inevitable. This, uh, this view is scientifically problematic, and he outlines briefly some stuff that we'll go over in much more detail. Yet, this view is arguably theologically problematic, at least for Orthodox Jews and Christians who derive their understanding of divine action from the biblical text. This is easy to see in the first of these two formulations, where God's activity is confined to an act of creation or design at the very beginning of the universe. Such a front-end loaded view of design is, of course, a logically possible view, but it is indistinguishable from deism. It therefore contradicts the plainly theistic view of divine action articulated in the Bible where God acts in his creation after the beginning of the universe. And it also raises the question, well, when did God start to actually intervene? The version of theistic evolution that affirms that God created and upholds the laws of nature but does not actively direct the creation of life is also theologically problematic, at least for those who profess a biblical understanding of God's nature and powers. If God is not at least directing the evolutionary process, then the origin of the biological systems must be attributed in some part to nature acting independently of God's direction. This entails a diminished view of God's involvement in creation and divine sovereignty at odds with most traditional readings of the Bible, whether Jewish or Christian. A convoluted and scientifically vacuous explanation. Perhaps because evangelical Christian advocates of theistic evolution have not wanted to embrace either the logical or the theological problems in associated with affirming the third meaning of evolution, they've typically declined to specify whether they think the natural selection random mutation mechanism is directed or an undirected process. Instead, many affirm a scientifically convoluted and vacuous formulation of theistic evolution, at least insofar as it stands as an explanation for the appearance of design in living organisms. Natural selection acting on r random variations uh, is, was dis is discussed, and then it goes on to say, theistic evolutions who affirm the creative power of this, referring to natural selection, and perhaps other related evolutionary mechanisms have been loath to argue that God actively directed the evolutionary process in any discernible way. That, of course, would constitute a form of intelligent design, and most the theistic evolutions reject this idea outright. Skipping on, in the language of God, Collins does not specify whether the evolutionary process is directed or not, only that it could be directed. 
So trying to sit on the fence there. As he explains, evolution could appear to us be to be deriv driven by chance, but from God's perspective, the outcome would be entirely specified. Thus, God could be completely and intimately involved in the creation of all species, while from our perspective, this would appear a random and undirected process. Um, the emphasis was added there. Um, or to put it another way, we have moved from Richard Dawkins' famous statement that biology is the study of complicated things that have the appearance of having been designed for a purpose, but as uh, da uh, Dawkins would go on to say, really we're not, to the proposition that biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose, though that appearance of design is an illusion, classical Darwinism, even though there may be an intelligent designer behind it all, in which case the appearance wouldn't be an illusion after all. And this tangled, indeed convoluted way of view of the origin of living systems adds nothing to our scientific understanding of what caused living organisms to arise. It tells us nothing about God's role in the evolutionary process or even whether or not he had a role at all. It thus renders the modifier theistic in the term theistic evolution superfluous. Skipping on a little bit, to head off, uh, a, a, this is quoting John West, uh, to head off a different a direct collision between undirected Darwinism and the doctrine of God's sovereignty, Collins, uh, an, an evolutionist, or a theistic evolutionist, seems to depict God as a cosmic trickster who misleads people into thinking that the process by which they were produced was blind and purposeless, even when it wasn't. This book, a critique of two key meanings of theistic evolution. In the chapters that follow, we will provide a much more extensive critique of theistic evolution in three distinct sections of this book. Our three sections will not correspond to the three different meanings of the term evolution, but rather to three distinct disciplinary sets of concerns, scientific, philosophical, and theological. In the first section, we provide a scientific uh, critique of theistic evolution. We start our scientific critique of theistic evolution discussing the alleged creative power of the main mechanisms of evolutionary change because theistic evolutionists want to argue that God has worked undetectably through these various evolutionary mechanisms and processes to produce all the forms of life on our planet today. Uh, he says, it talks about chapter one, Douglas Sachs, chapter two is him. There's like 27 chapters, I'm gonna skip over uh, that part. In summary, just as there are different meanings of the term evolution, there can be different concepts of theistic evolution. In the chapters that follow, we highlight the versions of theistic evolution that the authors of this book regard as problematic or untenable. We highlight several different types of difficulties, scientific, philosophical, and theological, facing the most prob problematic formulations of theistic evolution. Now, we're getting to the theological one. I'll be a little briefer here. Uh, biblical and theological introduction, the incompatibility of theistic evolution with the biblical account of creation, and with important the Christian doctrines. You don't see that very often, but uh, it's there. Uh, this particular part's written by Re Wayne Gruden. The current debate about theistic evolution is not merely a debate about whether Adam and Eve really existed, though it is about that, nor is it merely a debate about some specific details such as whether Eve was formed from one of Adam's ribs, nor is it a debate about some minor doctrinal issue over which Christians have differed for centuries. The debate is about much more than that. From the standpoint of theology, the debate is primarily about the proper interpretation of the first three chapters of the Bible, and particularly whether those chapters should be understood as truthful historical narrative, reporting events that actually happened. <clears throat> this is a question of much significance because those chapters provide the historical foundation for the rest of the Bible and for the entirety of the Christian faith. And that means the debate is also about the validity of several major Christian doctrines for which those three chapters are foundational. In Genesis 1 to 3, Scripture teaches essential truths about the activity of God in creation, the origin of the universe, the creation of plants and animals on the earth, the origin and unity of the human race, the creation of manhood and womanhood, the origin of marriage, the origin of human sin and human death, and man's need for redemption from sin. 
Without the foundations laid down in these three chapters, the rest of the Bible would make no sense, <coughs> and many of those doctrines would be undermined or lost. It is no exaggeration to say that these three chapters are essential to the rest of the Bible. From the standpoint of science and philosophy, however, this is also a debate about scientific methodology and evidence. Specifically, the philosophical chapters in this book will ask whether the rules of science actually require scientists to consider only strictly materialistic explanations for the origin of life, so that even scientists who believe in God must affirm some kind of materialistic theory of evolution as the best scientific th explanation of origins. These chapters will argue that such a limitation to materialistic explanations actually prevents scientists from, from pursuing the truth. Skipping over a little bit what this book is not about. This book is not about the age of the earth. We are aware that many sincere Christians hold a young earth position. The earth is perhaps 10,000 years old. And many others hold an old earth position. The earth is 4.5 billion years old. This book does not take a position on that issue, nor do we discuss it at any point in the book, although there are interesting implications. Uh, furthermore, we did not think it wise to frame the discussion of this book in terms of whether the Bible's teachings about creation should be interpreted literally. That, this is because in biblical studies, the phrase literal interpretation is often a slippery expression that can mean a variety of different things to different people, and that is definitely true. Um, he talks about the use of the word day and what it means and where it fits. This book is not concerned with deciding which of these understandings that he's listed of Genesis 1 is correct or which ones are properly literal. So he's completely, the, the, the book is not intended to take sides on any of this. Instead, the question is whether Genesis 1 through 3 should be understood as a historical narrative in the sense of reporting events that the author wanted readers to believe actually happened. In later chapters, my argument and the additional arguments of John Currid and Guy Waters will be that Genesis 1 through 3 should not be understood as primarily figurative or allegorical literature, but should rather be understood as historical narrative, though it is historical narrative with certain unique characteristics. And there's some chapters on that. Finally, this book is not about whether people who support theistic evolution are genuine Christians or are sincere in their beliefs. And I think that's an important point to make. But we are concerned that they believe that the theory of evolution is so firmly established that they must accept it as true and must use it as their guiding framework for the interpretation of Genesis 1 through 3. For example, Carl Giberson and Francis Collins write, the evidence for macroevolution that has emerged in the past few years is now overwhelming. Virtually all geneticists consider that the evidence prov proves common ancestry with a level of certainty comparable to the evidence that the Earth goes around the, the Sun. And that's an example of something that the book will challenge. Our goal in this book is to say to our friends who support theistic evolution and to many others who have not made up their minds about this issue, one, that recent scientific evidence presents such significant challenges to key tenets of evolutionary theory that no biblical interpreter should think that an evolutionary interpretation of Genesis is scientifically necessary. That's one. Two, that theistic evolution depends on a strictly materialistic definition of science that is philosophically problematic. And three, that the Bible repeatedly presents as actual historical events many specific aspects of the origin of human beings and other living creatures that cannot be reconciled with theistic evolution. And that a denial of those historical specifics seriously undermines several crucial Christian doctrines. Not bad for a really good summary. Theistic evolution claims that Genesis 1 through 3 is not a historical narrative that reports events that actually happened. One, Genesis 1 through 3 is figurative or allegorical literature, not factual history. At the heart of theistic evolution is the claim that the first three chapters of, Gen of the Bible should not be understood as a historical narrative in the sense of claiming that the events it records actually happened. I happen to disagree with that point, and we'll come back to it. <clears throat> I, I think it's true, but I don't think it's the heart. Dennis Lamoureux, 
Peter ends, he's going to quote some people, Francis Collins, John Walton, and then he says, in all of these approaches, the result is the same, Genesis 1 through 3, or at least Genesis 1 and 2, should not be understood as claiming to be a report of actual historical events. There's something else. A definition of theistic evolution, as Steve Meyer explained above in his scientific and philosophical introduction, our focus in this book is on the version of theistic evolution that affirms the sufficiency or creative power of the unguided, undirected mechanism of mutation and natural selection as an explanation for the origin of new forms of life and the appearance of design that they manifest. Skipping over a whole bunch of stuff because we'll be covering it later. But humans are also, this is interesting, this is a list of six things that Francis Collins said, and Francis Collins also said this, which is, but humans are unique, also unique in ways that defy evolutionary explanation and point to our spiritual nature. So apparently at this point, Francis Collins diverges from evolutionary theory. This includes the existence of the moral law, the knowledge of right and wrong, and the search for God that characterizes all human cultures throughout history. So be nice to Francis Collins. He may be persuadable. <clears throat> God was the creator of matter, not of living creatures. And I'll skip over a little bit of that. There, these are things that ev theistic evolutionists would say. Um, there were only, not merely two, but 10,000 ancestors for the human race. And a little follow-up on that, regarding the origin of the human race, Christians who support theistic evolution differ over whether Adam and Eve actually existed as historical persons. Some, such as uh, Dennis Lamoureux uh, cited above, do not believe that Adam and Eve ever existed, while others believe in a historical Adam and Eve. But even this historical Adam and Eve is still not the Adam and Eve of the Bible because they do not believe that they were the first human beings or that the whole human race descended from them. This is because they claim that current genetic studies indicate that the human race today is so diverse that we could not have descended from just two individuals such as an original Adam and Eve. This will be taken up in another chapter, or another set of chapters actually. Skipping over a little bit there, then who were Adam and Eve? Well, Dennis Alexander, according to the Model C, uh, God in his grace chose a couple of Neolithic farmers in the Near East, perhaps around 8,000 years ago. The precise date is of little importance for this model, or maybe a community of farmers to whom he chose to reveal himself in a special way, calling them into fellowship with himself so that they might know him as a personal God. That's one way of dealing with it. Of course, two among many. Um, the difficulty with all these theistic evolution explanations of Adam and Eve arises because they differ significantly from the biblical account in Genesis 1 through 3. They all propose that many thousands of human beings were on the earth prior to Adam and Eve, so Adam and Eve were not the first human beings, nor has the entire human race descended from them. In addition, there was human death and human sin, such as violence, instinctive aggression, and worship of false gods long before Adam and Eve. Um, and then they outline 12 differences between events count recounted in the Bible and theistic evolution, basically claiming that theistic evolution is not biblical. And I'm just going to skip over those, plus a little bit more. Yet, as I will argue in chapter 27, no one would derive such a reading of the narrative from simply reading the biblical text alone. And I think that's a really important thing. The biblical text does not teach theistic evolution. To, do, to believe in theistic evolution, you have to do violence to the biblical text. Skipping over a few more, a non-historical reading of Genesis 1 through 3 does not arise from factors in the text itself, but rather depends upon a prior commitment to an evolutionary framework of interpretation, a framework that the science and philosophy chapters in this volume show to be unjustified. And I would agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, <clears throat> and then a, I think this is his final paragraph. But before you reach these chapters, those chapters, the chapters on theology, please consider the arguments and evidence in the science and philosophy chapters, for they will show that no one today should feel compelled by modern science to adopt an evolutionary framework for interpreting Genesis 1 through 3. Yet that is precisely what contemporary theistic evolutionists do. And I agree with him 
on that point. Now, my own opinion on this is that I agree with the organization of the book. Without the scientific and philosophical chapters, the theological chapters could arguably simply encourage disbelief in the Bible, which is why some long age advocates argue that we should discuss the theology rather than the science, because they really want to be freed from the Bible as, uh, as a guide to their own life. I think that Steve Fuller has nailed it. The Reformation and the Scientific Revolution were two aspects of the same process. And the Christian, and I would maintain Adventist theology, can be deeply compatible with science, especially in its suspicion of human authority. And that's why I wrote the book, Scientific Theology. I think there's a deep connection between the two, and the historical connection is emblematic of the theoretical connection. At the heart of theistic evolution, you may remember this quote, is the claim that the first three chapters of the Bible should not be understood as a historical narrative in the sense of claiming that the events it records actually happen. I don't think that's at the heart. I think it's near the heart. I think it's implied by the heart, but it's not actually at the heart. Um, you see, the heart has two intertwined ideas and the above follows from them. The intertwined ideas, the first one is theological defeatism. That is, whenever science and religion conflict, religion always loses. Galileo, Darwin, you know. So we should never make any testable claims, and if we do, we should abandon them at the first sign of an attack. Don't go there, you're going to lose. The second is what I would call accommodationism. Uh, we should never do anything to upset our atheist colleagues. Why make them angry when we're destined to lose the argument eventually anyway? And I think that is at the heart of theistic evolution, at least the non-ID theistic evolution. This transforms Christianity into a nice, pious system that can say nothing about the real world. If applied consistently, it would mean that we should surrender all the core Christian doctrines. The resurrection is, after all, anti-scientific. Bodies just don't do that in the real world. The second coming will intrude into history in a non-scientific way. If, that is, at least if science must be made for atheism, made safe for atheism. And frankly, the Bible has very little use for this approach. First Timothy 3, 1 through 5, you may remember this, know also that in the last days, Perilous time shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, and going through this list, and then it says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. You have this religion, but it doesn't really intrude into real life. It doesn't have that power. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Yes. Um. It's interesting to me that uh, in this discussion uh, they've isolated Genesis 1 to 3 uh, and are ignoring certain other factors. Uh, probably the most direct words we have in the Bible from God are the Ten Commandments. They're not in Genesis 1 to 3, as we know. Uh, and there God states directly he did it in six days. Don't worry, that will come out in, uh, in the chapter on the Old Testament. And uh, Peter, of course, refers to uh, ideas of God being, being ignored. Christ seemed to treat Genesis yes. 1 to 3 as literal. Yes. Uh, it's not that easy to cut that, uh, those Thursday chapters out. No, it's true. Yes. Everyone who believes in long age, but also believes in God, is a theistic evolutionist. Is that incorrect? Uh, like that Stephen it, well, Meyer. there was a time there was a time when that would have been correct because theistic evolution was kind of vague. What intelligent design has done is forced a division in that list. 
So Stephen, and where you will have a number of people who believe in long ages, some of whom who believe in common descent even, but who distinctly don't believe that evolution can account for everything. And those people will agree with most of the conclusions of this book. But uh, they, they may have some difficulty with the, uh, you know, the human stuff. And the human stuff really starts um, going in interesting uh, directions. Uh, you know, how, how humans came to be. If you allow for long ages, it makes it a lot easier to say that they, that they evolved. And if you buy the standard narrative, it makes it difficult to deny that they evolved. Uh, but if you challenge the standard narrative, and we're going to hear a little bit about that next week, uh, and some more in some of, those cha uh, the, some of those chapters, I think 13 through 16, if I remember correctly, um, that uh, that will also challenge uh, the kind of history uh, that theistic evolution, even intelligent design friendly theistic evolution, would agree with. The reason I'm making this point is because Michael Behe is a theistic evolutionist. He believes that it took long time and he believes that things are related to each other, but he believes that it took some kind of a miracle to get from point A to point B, and that that you can't get, for example, uh, vertebrates out of sponges without some kind of intelligent design. Did it happen all at once? Did it was it a design? But you can tell that the standard non-directed theory just simply won't work. And when you say that. You suddenly have God intervening in natural history, and Behe is hated almost as much as a young earth creationist. Because the dividing line is, do you make science safe for atheists? And theistic evolutionists would do that? Theistic evolutionists would make science safe for atheists. So Stephen Meyer, I understand he does believe in long age, but he considers himself an ID person. Right, and he is not uh, made welcome by the standard scientific community. Or theistic evolutionists? In fact, he wrote something that... Uh, that actually got retracted after having been peer-reviewed in the standard way um, because they didn't want this in the scientific literature. Because you see, if it's not in the peer-reviewed literature, you don't have to deal with it. The fact of the matter is it was in the peer-reviewed literature, but we'll just pretend that it, it didn't count. I have a question for you. Usually I have comments, but I'll start with a question this time. Uh, since you've read the book, maybe you can point the direction we're going. A very common mantra among the old earth creationists, they have a common mantra, and they simply say, the Bible tells us the who of creation. Who is the creator? Science tells us the how of creation. Does the book really deal with that particular issue? <coughs> um, the book would deny that science tells us, science being, meaning the current scientific consensus. Uh, the book would deny that science tells us the how of creation. Now, the when of creation the book officially, and you read the, the thing, officially takes no position. The scientific parts of the book are written giving evolution all the rope that it asked for and pointing out that it still hangs itself. 
Um, the theological ones officially try to walk the line between old earth and young earth creation and even not deliberately uh, uh, push back on uh, unintelligent design friendly theistic evolution. But the fact that the scientific thing says that man can't have evolved from the animals without divine assistance kind of starts to lean you more towards old earth slash young earth creationists. And in fact, the old earth creationists have a problem because Neanderthals are human. Sorry about that. And that means that the creation has to be before the Neanderthals. In fact, it, I think it's arguable that the creation has to be before a Homo erectus. And I think, think, in fact, that now that we have the footprints from Crete, the creation has to go back supposedly 5.7 billion years or so. And that makes it very, very uncomfortable for old age creationists. And they won't say that out loud. And old earth creationists are free to kind of ignore that. But the fact of the matter is that the scientific evidence is starting to be very comfortable for young earth creationists and, and not for the old earth creationists. Um, and even though they don't take sides, that makes it, it starts making it very sticky. Um, and the theistic evolutionists, if you make a division between humans and, and, and apes, and they do argue that that's the case, uh, then uh, it starts making it tough for, for uh, you know, ID-friendly theistic evolutionists even. Uh, again, they will not attack them directly. There are no lobs sent that way. But the field has changed to a point where this is actually a very, very young Earth creationist friendly book. There are no direct attacks, and I don't even think there are any really significant indirect attacks against. This could have been written uh, by a bunch of uh, well, it would, it would take them to be broad-minded a little bit, but it could have been written by people from uh, Creation Research Society Quarter. Uh, we, we generally don't think in those broad terms, but I think that uh, I think there's nothing th that's in there that really grates against uh, a young Earth creation sensibility. Uh, this is the statement you just ma made is um, depicts something highly unusual, unique to this type of approach. As you know, most old earth creationists just almost revel in attacking young earth creationists. You have names like Davis Young. Giberson and Collins like to jab at young earth creationists. But wait, Giberson and Collins are not old earth creationists. Oh, okay. Okay. They're uh, neutral. No, right? they're not neutral. So what are they? <laughs> they are theistic evolutionists, type two, of the oh, atheist-friendly yeah. creation, atheist -friendly. theistic okay. evolutionists. And that's why you see the jabs. You will notice that Steve Meyer is one of the editors of this book. He's a old earth, maybe, maybe not, uh, um, uh, tree of life guy. Mm -hmm. But he has the sensibility to realize who his real friends are and who his real enemies are and to stay that way. Uh, that's why there's a division between those two. Mm -hmm. Is there evidence for God's activity? You see, if there's no evidence for God's activity, then you can be friends with the atheists because they all believe the same stuff you do except the, for the religion stuff. If you're on the ID side, the 
atheists are just wrong. And, and maybe not provably wrong, but at least demonstrably wrong. You, you can show that there's good reason to believe they're wrong. And, um, and, and at that point, there is a division between the two. And you can see the division in the fact that uh, Kenneth Miller, who's atheist, mm -hmm. a Catholic no less, debated Michael Behe, who is atheist, a Catholic no less, and both of them have the same age frame and both of them have um, uh, the same belief in common descent. But Behe says there's evidence for God's activity um, and um, Kenneth Miller says no. And so they have a debate and right there's a dividing point. Kenneth Miller believes there is a God, but there's no evidence. Yes. He, yes. And of course, that makes you look a little foolish when you're talking with they're atheists because they're splitting uh, I believe hair. in God, but there's no evidence. Well, why do you believe in God? Yeah. Ooh, this is really confusing. Uh, we have a question here and another one over here. Uh, let's get, you yeah. Want to take this? Yeah, I can take that up. Go ahead. Can you be a purist, theistic evolution, uh, evolutionist, and and believe that you can have God insert things through as time goes? Well, y you may notice that when I said that um, that Kenneth Miller left himself a little wiggle room for God to do that. Perhaps God works in quantum, uh, um, in the quantum gaps, so that He can cause mutations that would. Well, but see, but the thing of it is, then those are statistically testable. You know, are the mutations really more than what you would expect just from random variations? Well, if the answer is yes, then you actually, like it or not, are now an intelligent design advocate. Because that's what intelligent design says. God did it, and we can tell. But if you're a, a directed evolutionist, there's got to be some insertion somewhere for the direction to happen. Yes. And then, then, the, then the question is, where do you draw a line where you see that, that influencing, directing the, invo the, the evolution? So you could go from, you know, molecular stuff that you can hardly see, you know, God, God um, controlling chance or whatever thing, clear up to inserting a new species, to just dropping them off on the earth somewhere. Sure, and now you're old earth creationist. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so there's... That's something to think about right yeah. there, and just, no, no, just it is. for the directed yeah. part of the of yeah. evolutionists. There are several important questions. One is there a God, and that separates position five from all the other ones. The next question is, can God interact with nature detectably? And if you answer yes, now you're in the four versus three. And if you answer yes also, position five is no good. Because if God can be detected, then you can't say there's no God. And that's where the, the, uh, the most significant cultural war is being fought right now. Then you can say, well, uh, did God just take and plant stuff brand new? And of course, if so, how? Did he have to do it one mutation at a time and finally jump all the way? Or did he just flat out jump with, you know, five million mutations or whatever it took to get from sponges to earthworms or whatever? Okay. Yeah, there's, there's no way to draw that line. Well, uh, uh, the, the, the line can Theoretically, be, anyway. Yeah, that's I don't right. Know, that's I don't right. know as far as uh, being observable, but... Uh -huh. um, 
But the really important line becomes a theological one, what about apes and humans? And if you draw that line, then you're into the, either the old earth or the young earth creationist. And if you draw, the, the next line is, what about the flood? And how long did it take? And that puts you between the second and the first one. And that's basically the line that needs to be drawn. Th those, those five lines. Right now, the most important line is the line between the ID friendly and not ID friendly. And I think that the culture has got that part right. Because once you go ID friendly, then what's to stop God from not just dropping things in species at a, or a whole genera at a time? And in fact, the evidence is that he did, if that's the case, because the Cambrian explosion and the mammalian explosion and the avian explosion and, I mean, you can go through the list. They all come down, poof! As Richard Dawkins said once, like they were planted there. Okay? Yeah, you, you think I'm kidding. Google it sometime. Um, and, and, and then the only real question is how long did it take? And if you answer how long did it take, you're in the, you're in the young earth, or at least the young life creationist camp, in which case you, you pretty much, you might as well take Genesis at face value. Yes? Who's next? Oh, yeah, that, that's right, I forgot about you. Sorry about that. Uh, I've heard many inferences too, but yet not, and I have not heard the term actually referred to, but there is one approach that answers all the questions. Progressive creation. Progressive creation is probably the same as old earth creation. Yeah, you know, I would say well, it's closer uh, to, to ID, but in other words, God came back whenever it was appropriate and dropped in some new arrangement. Well, that's but, old earth. That's old earth, flat out. Well, old earth is phrased in many more different ways. It's, in other words, many old earth creationists still believe in a single creative event that got things started. Progressive creation brings God back, as I understand, whenever needed. Well, that is true of Old Earth as well. Hugh Ross is very, well, very strong on that particular Well, that's, point. A, that's a dimension of Old Earth I have not understood. I'll have to think about it. Okay. More. I'm not pushing progressive creation as an no, effective no. alternative. I, I think it's a bit simplistic, but. No, uh, but, but Old Earth is, is in fact, uh, Hugh Ross would say, God, Cambrian explosion happened, God just planted those organisms right there. How he planted them, whether he did one, you know, one pair, or who knows. But, but that they were just kind of plopped in and that they didn't have an organic relationship with the sponges that came before or whatever. No, it's, it's just there. So that is, that is one of the options. Um, one of the things you want to keep in mind is the, how, what you call it is not as important as what its basic tenets are. Of course. Uh, you know, and the idea that you can make evolutionary creation, uh, I mean, just stick with theistic evolution. It makes the same point. Um, all, all that happens when you, when you rename things is you confuse people. Now you have to say old name, new name, whatever. Yeah, well, these are the kinds of approaches that if you're involved in working with students in these areas. You, yeah. A lot of it you just avoid because it's too easy to come off as a simplistic fix that yeah. you pulled yeah. out of the air. In fact, speaking about the names, I think that there's uh, Howard Van Til who was an uh, advocate for fully gifted creation. And the idea is that when God created, boom, he did this, and then all of it evolved from there on because it was already pre-programmed in. But when you hear it, it sounds like young earth creationism. One other question. Uh, I'm sure you're aware of uh, G.A. Kirkut's implications of evolution. Kirkut's implications? Yes. Or you're not. Well, I'm familiar with provines, but. 
Kirkett uh, was one of the most highly recognized uh, authorities on the origin of the invertebrates. And he basically concludes his book with the best model is an evolutionary forest. It's and one that, that has that been neglected, but, this but this is a this is a zoologist of, of granted quite a few decades ago, yeah. who is extremely well recognized as one of the major zoologists in the world. You know, an evolutionary force that's intelligent is actually intelligent design. Sure. Yes. If I walk into a science lab and I begin an experiment and it has 66 steps and I stop at step one, I'm in trouble. So <laughs> my question is, if we camp too long on Genesis without pursuing the rest of the hike, then how can we really come to a conclusion that's that fits the whole experiment? I'm not probably saying that very clearly, but science and those who are studying this question of how is God involved in the beginnings of all beginnings, if if they don't if they don't take the step to look at the whole picture. I mean, it's like looking at a movie at the beginning and then drawing conclusions about the end and you haven't even gotten to the end of the movie. <laughs> yeah, 66. Uh, are we saying that we're spending more time on the beginning than we should because Yeah. How can those two be in the same science event? Well, the, the contradiction between theistic and evolution is, is actually going to be something that, these, that the book will uh, push very hard. That, that evolution as designed, as the theory was designed, did not need God, did not use God was a way of getting an explanation for the appearance of design without design itself. And if you accept that, then there is no need of God, I guess until you get to um, history in the traditional sense, you know, the dealings of people, um, which Genesis 1 is kind of excluded from. Genesis 2, for that matter, is kind of excluded from. In fact, if push come to shove, I think they would say Genesis 3 is kind of excluded from. Uh, and so anything in the Bible that depends on them is just not valid. Which, and, and that's why we're spending this much time on it is because the fact of the matter is that if you start out by saying 2 plus 2 equals 5, you can literally prove anything. I mean, I have seen uh, somebody show by logical steps that if 2 plus 2 is 5, then I am the Pope. Um, it, it, it sounds crazy, but once you allow error into your system, there is, no, there is no place where you can cut it off. You cannot produce a, um, you cannot produce a totally self-consistent erroneous system. Now, you can ignore the anomalies in your system if you want. But the fact of the matter is that if you start out by saying 
um, that God didn't have anything to do with creation, then by logical steps, you can show that the Bible's not reliable, not just the Genesis part of the Bible, but the Exodus part of the Bible, the, uh, the narratives of Matthew and Mark are not reliable, um, the narrative of Luke is not reliable because he traces um, Jesus' genealogy all the way back to Adam who was the son of God. And I, I mean, you just keep going and you will find that nothing really is reliable. The Apostle Paul talks about, as in Adam all die, well, so in Christ shall be all, all be made alive. Well, if Adam wasn't a real person, then I guess Christ and Christ were not made all made alive. All of a sudden, that whole, you see, uh, and it is the reason why we're pay, paying so much attention to it is because it is the crux of the controversy between scientific. Uh, materialism in uh, the United States and Europe and Canada and Australia and everywhere uh, I mean the Western world whatever you want to call it it is the crux of the dispute between that and Christianity so I wasn't referring to us as much as I was referring to theistic evolutionists the theistic evolutionists are not self-consistent and that's one of the things that is going to be shown in this book very clearly. You saw a little bit of it as we were going through the introduction where they talk about God guiding an unguided process. We can't do that. I mean, even God cannot make a square circle. You know, they're logically not compatible with each other. Yes. Um, I'd like to describe uh, progressive creation for Jack's sake. Maybe elaborate. I think he has a pretty good knowledge of what it's about. Progressive creation actually started in the evangelical world by conservative, Bible believing, some of them verbal inspirationists. That's why. Um, literal is a slippery word in this study. It can be very slippery. In my doctoral studies there at Andrews University, I was tasked with the assignment of looking at prominent evangelicals and how they were solving the problem between Genesis and science. The first person I looked at was probably the most important, and that's Bernard Ram. Bernard Ram wrote a book in 1954 the Christian view of science and scripture. I had the privilege of spending over an hour with him in his home out here in Orange County. After uh, you'd read the book. After I'd read the book, and I could ans ask key questions, and uh, the discussion was very enlightening. To really understand a book, you need to talk personally to the author. Yeah. Isn't does, that does true? He, does he fall more in the camp of old earth creationism or more in the I'll, I'll get camp? to that. Yeah, okay. To understand a book, the Bible, you really have to know personally the author of scripture. That's a very important point. But um, what uh, I wanted him to elaborate on is how much was he a theistic evolutionist and how much was he a creationist? Because he seemed to be walking right on top of the fence, and he could kind of tip either way depending on circumstances. And so I wanted to help uh, him clarify <laughs> his position. Well, I, I was aware of the name, but y your allusion to walking on the fence, <laughs> am I, I think that's a very apt one. I, I think he fell quite frequently. He, he <laughs> okay. <coughs> Didn't That's matter. an occupational hazard of walking the fence. Yes, exactly. And actually, his book was what sparked the modern revival of young earth creationism. Because uh, Henry Morris was right there in the middle of the debate, debate starting in the late 1940s, going all through the 1950s. And by 1961, Morris had a response to Bernard Ram namely the book, The Genesis Flood, see. And so... With Whitcomb. With Whitcomb, and then Morris, he was not only reacting 
to Bernard Ram, he was trying to update the arguments of Seventh-day Adventist George McGrady Price on geology. So he was walking a fine line too, <laughs> trying to combine those two things. But anyway, back to Bernard Ram. What did he really believe? He really believed that scripture is trustworthy. Genesis 1 and 2 are trustworthy. He believed that there was a historical element. See, I've kind of broadened it a bit. Not necess not, he was anti-literalist. He made fun of George McGrady Price. He made fun of a very prominent uh, anti-evolutionist back then. Um, I'll probably think of the name in a minute who was going around all the Baptist campuses and lecturing and so on. So he, he took that position that the Bible was inspired, it's a historical document, but he wanted to update it in terms of modern science. So he came up with the idea that God intervenes at specific points in geological history. And that's basically kind of the ID position today. Uh, of course, ID was not around as a, uh, a well thought through mm -hmm. concept mm -hmm. back in the 1950s, 60s, or even 70s. I think it was probably hatching in the 80s or so, or early 90s, especially with Behe. So he, I asked him, I said, you know, if God intervenes at specific points and injects fully formed organisms with a full complement of DNA, are you aware that there's a scientific view that's kind of comparable to what you're saying, namely Stephen Jay Gould's punctuated equilibrium, the idea that evolution has fits and stops spurts and stops, spurts mm -hmm. and stops, and a naturalistic process, of course, with yeah. Gould. Yeah. And so what Bernard Ram was doing was superimposing a theos theistic process on that concept. Well, before that, we had Goldschmidt and the Helpful Monster. Yeah, and even before that, you have a book called Quantum Evolution, that evolution is not gradualism. It was very much anti-Darwinian or anti lyellian mm -hmm. but uh, it was that evolution has jumps and then uh -huh. quiescent periods. And so Bernard Ram explained to me, I, I asked him, well, what happens between the gaps where God is not inserting anything new. He said, well, evolution does the whole thing between those gaps. Very naturalistic. And so you have something here that's a little different than theistic evolution where God is continually guiding mm -hmm. the process. Mm -hmm. But God removes himself at key moments. He starts up the vertebrates. He starts up the the bird uh, population. He starts the angiosperms, flowering plants. And then he steps back and lets evolution do a whole lot of the process. That's progressive creationism in my mind yeah. that I glean from it. And when you insist that it actually happens in one particular point where God gets in there and get his, gets his fingers dirty, so to speak, then you're, you're really talking old earth creationism. You are, definitely. Yeah, yeah he would take that view. And he was actually divided, uh, he was delighted to hear about uh, Stephen J. Gould. He hadn't re read anything about Gould. Well, let's see. Got it. Oh, I think Warren is right about, uh, you know, you've got to get acquainted with the, the author. Uh, you can imagine an alien coming across a Tesla on its way to Mars and them trying to figure out why is there a Tesla on its way to Mars. Uh, they would never, it'd be impossible for them to know the reason it's, there's a Tesla in space flying to Mars. And uh, uh, so uh, in, in this interpretation, in this in, in view, perspectives in this book too, uh, you, you've got to take into account a bigger picture like she was saying, uh, is that 
it's really what was behind the design of the earth was the plan of salvation, which was initially put in place prior to anything that was created. That was already in place. And it's, it was that plan of salvation that determined the design of the earth for God's purpose so that the plan of salvation would be successful. And that kind of consideration is not a part of any of this discussion. It will be at the end because we will be talking about, um, you know, the, the, the theological uh, difficulties of theistic evolution and, um, and then uh, when we do, um, then, then the, the question of how theistic evolution relates to the uh, plan of salvation, I think, Will be will come full, f full front and center. Um, I'm going to say one other thing, and then I'll let you have the last word. Um, you had mentioned that if you want to really understand a book, you need to know its author. Next week, you may remember we went through contested bones, and we're going to get to meet the author. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. Go ahead. Uh, just referring to Jack's uh, comment about uh, creation being old and six day, uh, this is a fairly strong belief among some Seventh-day Adventists uh, mm -hmm. that uh, they believe, oh, they believe in six-day creation, yes, but it was way down, way a long time ago. And it is a position that you cannot take if you have any familiarity with the fossil record which is unique, has unique uh, organisms at different levels. There is no way God did, in six days, did everything in six days when you have such uniqueness. Uh, the flood is the only answer to that uh, con incongruity there that I know of. And uh, if you really know the fossil record, you have to drop that uh, idea that uh, it could be a, it was a long time ago and you know, God did it all in six days. A long time ago, it won't work with follow yeah. the record. Well, I'm going to suggest that um, conservative creationists, uh, you know, short age creationists, might be able to produce their own book regarding that particular theological division uh, and the scientific evidence for and against it. <laughs> well, maybe so. Who knows? Anyway. Uh, come back next week and we will get to meet the author of Contested Bones.